as our first question has um, just ended on and alluded to, uh, this, this notion of worship, this true danger and glory of worship, moves us beyond the myopic vision uh, experience of our congregational life and, and sees uh, what we're doing in Sunday as part of uh, the rest of the week and God's work in the world. Um, so let's talk about um, what you have argued and um, Steve, you've uh, affirmed and taught in your classes of the indivisible, inseparable relationship between worship and justice. Well, I, th I do try to argue in the book that I see them as being inseparable and they're inseparable because they're an expression of the reality of God, that, um, that God is worthy of worship and that God is a just God. And, that God's, um, the, the expression of God's life, which is what our worship is meant to embody. By showing God glory, I do it by not just saying the word glory to God uh, 45 times in the singing of a chorus or a hymn. I actually show God glory by becoming a person in community with other people who together are, are, are an increasingly clear reflection of the character of the God that we worship. So that's what shows God glory. I'm literally reflecting, I'm participating in the reflection of the reality of God to God and to the world around me. I can't do that if I don't bear some of the marks of the priorities and passions of that God. And I would argue that in Old and New Testament alike, that God is seen as a God who has particularly uh, acute sensitivities and concerns and passions for the abuses of power and for the, the, the destruction of individual and, and collective lives that come about as a consequence of those decisions, which are really about a life that's really centered almost always on, on someone else having power and denying other people power. So that gets us fairly quickly into the vortex of issues that have to do with justice, and that's part of why, uh, again, in Isaiah 58, when, when, when Isaiah, the prophet refers to the worship of Israel, the thing that Israel most prided itself on was its worship, that it had the right God, it had the right worship practices, it had the right architecture, it had, uh, as it were, all the best songs, and it was also in crisis over its worship to such an extent that God says he hates the worship. Why? Because it's as if worship. It's as if you practice righteousness, the prophet says, as if this is really going to show up in your life. And instead, what the prophet, I think, is pointing to is this incredible delineation where on the one hand you have worship practices that on the other hand are completely separated from your social ethical practices which actually demonstrate that you violate my character even while you're claiming to seek my character. Well, the prophet says you can't have it both ways and if you're committed to a worship that's really about seeking your own ends, not my ends, if your worship day is really more about you than it is about me, then it shows the bankruptcy of your worship. What kind of worship do I seek? Is it this kind of worship? No, the second half of Isaiah 58 is, no, let me tell you the kind of worship that I seek. And what's described in the second half of Isaiah 58 is this portrait of a, of a responsiveness, a yieldedness, an attentiveness, a care, a compassion, a mercy, a justice that is attentive particularly to the poor, the marginalized, the forgotten, the neglected people. That's a reflection of God because that's the character of a God who hears the cries of the poor and the oppressed and the lost and the forgotten, the widow and the orphan. That's, that's what bears the distinctive marks of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God ultimately made known uh, in Jesus Christ. So it's, it's that distinctive love. Do you want to sh show that you worship me? Then live a life that looks like my life. Don't claim to worship me and live a life that looks like your life. That's not the kind of worship life that I'm looking for. And that's the dissonance, but that's also potentially the congruity. So the congruity is found when our life begins to become a reflection of the heart and passions of God's distinctive character. That's not going to be a self-serving character. That's why real worship is, is, is a danger to a self-interested vision of our life. Yeah. And I'd also want to say that it, it's not only the case that, that our worship experience needs to flow into these lives characterized by love of neighbor and, and justice concern. Uh, it, it also goes the other way as well, that when a community is, is in fact loving their neighbors, when they are in fact engaged in the purposes of God uh, close to home and around the world, that flows in and shapes and enriches our worship experience as well. The congruence can have impacts in both ways. Um, I know that the congregation that we're members of in Chicago, 
has a long history of, of engagement with um, a variety of social justice concerns. And the richness that flows out of uh, having uh, a congregation filled with people with advanced degrees and the homeless at the same time flowing into worship experience, the cultural diversity, the languages that come into play, makes that Sunday morning experience all the more rich as well. So this inseparability of worship and justice, love of God, love of neighbor, flows in, in, in both directions and becomes. Which is what First John so magnificently captures, right? I can't claim to love God and ignore my neighbor. I can't ignore my neighbor and claim to love God. There's this sort of constant um, movement back and forth between love of God and love of neighbor that really are inseparable. And, and it's, it's the connection that gives a, 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 a Christian, a, 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 a Christocentric focus to our efforts at justice. Mm -hmm. And it's the justice focus that gives authenticity and reality to our worship. Mm -hmm. I've sometimes told my students that uh, worship without justice is hypocrisy mm -hmm. and justice without worship is idolatry. Mm -hmm. And we've got to have both uh, together. Yeah. And, and the, the scandal is that it's too easy to bifurcate these right. things and right. divide them, whether it's in our own lives or in our communities. Right. So when you put justice and worship together, how does that reform both concepts into something uniquely Christian? Well, one of the ways that I try to define uh, worship in my own thinking is that worship is the right ordering of reality and justice is the right ordering of power in particular. So where do we see those things most distinctively displayed? I would say we most distinctively see them displayed in the life and ministry of Jesus. So what reorders it is that if I really do believe that the claim that Jesus is Lord is not just a doctrinal claim or a personal form of salvation, but actually a declaration of, of how to live life in a world that is reordered by the reality of God made known in Christ in any and every dimension, then it, it fundamentally reorders our understandings of worship and our understandings of justice because Jesus is the incarnation of, of, the, of a life that is a rightly ordered life that honors God and neighbor that uses power to its own uh, appropriate ends and not against uh, my neighbor or for my own personal gain. It's, it's completely redefining. Sadly, the church, of course, has decided that it wants to have, hold on to two worlds at one time. Um, the very thing that Jesus has said that we can't do is the thing that the church often does. So on the one hand, we do want to operate in a social world where, where we define church and church life in a very ordinary institutional way that we claim is just simply a part of our natural sociology. But meanwhile, we claim that we are seeking to follow Jesus Christ as Lord as long as that Lordship can f be tailored to fit our social context. And um, there, therein lies the great rub. So I, I think for me, um, it, it, it's a constant challenge to ask the question, how deeply are we prepared to let Jesus as Lord actually shape and define the church? The history of the church suggests it's a very mixed picture. We are occasionally interested in that deep radical redefinition. We're more easily uh, prone to simply accommodate a sort of sociological form of Christian faith that is meaningful but not too awkward, not too costly, not too eccentric. Um, I think I, I'm just struck by how much domestication of God we do in that process and uh, certainly domestication of the gospel itself. It gets back to that earlier discussion about being asleep when, when we're so domesticated by these values that are all around us, we almost can't see it. Yeah. We, yeah. That's why it, it's so important for the church around the world to be able to be in dialogue with each other because we, we Americans, we have these blind spots that are, are, are so difficult to overcome and we need brothers and sisters from China and Africa and Latin America or the church throughout history can also uh, greatly help us in that regard um, to, to be able to open our eyes. Mark, I thought it was your emphasis on the issue of power becomes, I think, really key because uh, Christians have always claimed that in our worship, as we recognize God for who He is, one of those things that we say about God is that He is all-powerful. All hail the power of Jesus' name. We love to sing right. that. Um, and, 
And that, that reorientation of the fact that, that uh, power or all authority in heaven on earth has been given to Jesus, you know, right. great commission. That is a, a, a word of great comfort to those who are powerless, but it has this profoundly subversive element to those who have power. And in our middle class, upper middle class, North American settings, we are the ones with power. Right. And, and there rightly ought to be this reordering and subversive element to the power dynamic. Yet, it's this domestication that we end up saying, well, I guess it's really normal that we have power, and that's really a good thing, and we ought to celebrate that as opposed to really critique how are we using that power? Mm -hmm. Are we, in fact, using that power as Jesus did to wash the feet of other people, to be the servant, to be the slave of all? And uh, we don't get that right very often. No. I mean, I'm, I've often been struck by this about the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, which I think is the most confrontational of the four Gospels. And if you read the opening chapters of Matthew, it is scandalously confrontational. It begins with this genealogy in, in which are embedded four, embedded four names of really unexpected, somewhat questionable women, not to mention the questionable men that are also listed there. But nevertheless, this unexpectedness of these, of these four women. Um, which is really a kind of opening salvo, I think, in, in Matthew's way of understanding things. But yet we sort of easily jump over the genealogy, which I think is, is essentially saying God will use whomever God chooses to use whenever God chooses to use it. And yet this is the blue blood line that supposedly leads to Jesus. Then it comes to 14, 14, 14 generations. Then it moves on to God saying, okay, but in light of that genealogy, I'm actually going to do something entirely different that's not through Joseph's line, which is what that genealogy has been about, but about Mary, a vulnerable virgin young girl who's going to bear the savior of the world, Emmanuel, God with us. This unbelievable uh, drama of, of God choosing a young girl to be the avenue of Again, just like in the, in the genealogy, God choosing to use whomever he chooses to use, then that leads eventually not to the shepherds that we see in Luke, but to the, uh, the, the uh, coming of the astronomers uh, who are Gentiles, who wander in and have contact uh, you know, immediately with Herod, who in his own pettiness is immediately uh, a representation of Roman and Roman authority that's being redefined by the one who has been born, quote, king of the Jews. That leads, as you know, to the to the first genocide that we hear about uh, in the New Testament. The first two chapters of Matthew are shocking, shocking, shocking chapters. This is anything but a domesticated God. And yet, in the classic church treatment of Advent and of, uh, of the events leading up to the, to the birth of Jesus, it's often treated in this highly nuanced, hallmark-like way in which it all becomes a kind of you know, silent night moment with candles and sweetness, when in fact, the opening chapters of Matthew are, are awkward, and uh, it, it's what I have sometimes referred to as the smelling salts gospel. It's this sense that it's the gospel up your nose. Are you paying attention? Are you, are you awake to this? This is shocking, awkward stuff, and it's all about redefining authority and power. Who's God? Who is God going to use? What institutions are going to be redefined by the gospels? All that, which is was so edgy in its gospel uh, expression. Part of that, that edginess um, ought to give us space in our worship for realities of lament. Yes, yes, yes. And, and, and that's one of the things I, I find so lacking in so much contemporary worship. It's, it's largely this emotional monotone of celebration. Yes. And, and that, that you know, befits, befits our social position of, of basically prosperous and successful. But in our communities, there are people who are going through incredible seasons of pain, and we don't have anything in, in worship for that. It's interesting, after the uh, Herod slaughters the, these, these young boys in right. Bethlehem, uh, Matthew picks up on the quotation from Jeremiah by the voice of one crying in Ramah, refusing to be comforted right. there was, and and we sometimes go move over pain so quickly yes. because we want to get better right. you know we want to feel better back right. into our comfort thing right. that we refuse to let the the reality of injustice and pain and horror sit there mm -hmm. i remember so vividly a time at church we were attending 
uh, in this area, uh, good friends of ours in a Sunday school class that I was leading, uh, their two-year-old son was uh, had liver cancer and was battling for his life. Mm. And it was a, a long, hard battle. He finally died. And it was a couple weeks after that. And Kevin and Cindy, the parents, were, were there in church. And it was one of those days that we were singing our celebrations. And everybody's wanting to clap their hands. And there was, there was nothing in the service that at all acknowledged the variety of modes. And I remember turning to my wife and saying, I wonder how in the world Kevin and Cindy are able to connect in any way. And, and they would tell the story of how hard that was because we don't acknowledge the reality of the laments of life. And part of, the, part of linking our worship of God and our love of neighbor is that exposes us to the messiness of life right. exactly. and the pain of life and the need for uh, what you talked about a couple of days ago, not only that proverbial tradition of wisdom, but the Job tradition right. as well, where right. we grapple with God in the darkness, in the pain, in the hurt. And then out of that whirlwind, we, we end up encountering God. That's right, yeah. I mean, I, uh, likewise, I'm just very struck by the fact that so much of the language of the church has been impaired by these commitments towards sustaining certain themes, especially in our culture, themes of optimism, themes of hope, themes of, of resolution, all of which is a part of the, the gospel hope. I mean, there's no doubt that there is real hope and that there can be real confidence that God will make all things right. But there is an honesty in Scripture and an honesty certainly in the Gospels of Jesus' encounter with the messiness of human life and with the realities of human suffering, which the church simply doesn't have a kind of emotional vocabulary for, especially in a kind of standardizing vision of let's just give people an optimistic um, take-home message. And, and in that, often there's superficiality, there's denial, there's neglect, there's all kinds of things that have been abused really in that moment. And it doesn't mean that a church has to become morose uh, and depressed in its personality, but it does mean that there's got to be a, a, a rich emotional spectrum expressed in our life. And even within any given worship service, there have to be moments of this. I mean, I was interested, just recently I heard a, a videotape that was shot of some people who were in recovery who described, in one case, a, a pastor who at the moment of welcome said, uh, I want to welcome all of you here to worship this morning. I'm glad that we can all be together. I would particularly today, want to welcome those of you who have been courageous enough in the face of whatever addictions that you may be facing to actually be here. Because it's probably been really hard for you to be able to find a connection between what happens here often and your own sense of dogged failure. If that's the place that you're in today, I just want to congratulate you in actually, actually sitting here and coming. And I want you to bring the reality of your struggle and your addiction into the context of worship, confident that God wants to meet you as much as anyone else that's here today. The people that experienced this described this sense that they felt welcomed into worship in a way that they had never heard before. That somehow, not as a tail end, a forgotten matter, a slight oblique reference, a, a, a paragraph of condemnation in a sermon, but actually as an act of hospitality, they were invited to bring their weakness to worship, not just their strengths. And I think that is a, is a, to me, a reminder of the kind of themes that you're describing. Yeah. You guys took an interesting turn in the discussion here where we started with the relationship of justice um, and worship and so the proper ordering of reality and the proper ordering of power going together. And it's interesting that you're expressing, let me just say it this way and see if you'd agree with it, that there's also a sense that a disorder of power needs to correspond to um, a disorder of reality. And so the lament fits properly into the church service precisely because there is injustice in the world. Right, right. Yes. And, um, and so that range, and so it raises the next question for me. Uh, and Steve, you were talking about the way we would be wrong to think that worship's what happens on Sunday and justice happens on Monday through Saturday. Uh, you talked about how justice is part of the church service itself. I was thinking of the, the story you gave um, of the two people giving communion who ran into each other oh, right. and made a mess of communion and they had these evil glares in their face. Right, right. And there's a sense in which that's an issue of justice, of a love mm -hmm. of neighbor mm -hmm. that's being violated in that church service. Right. Um, so the question that I want to raise then, if, if justice and worship coincide Sunday through Saturday, what exactly are we doing on Sundays? What is this intense moment of gathering with lamentation and worship and justice and the realities of the injustice that we carry in our lives, the way we treat our spouse, our neighbors, mm -hmm. um, 
people who we have power over. What, what is Sunday? What, is, what do we do on Sunday? Well, I think what happens on Sunday is that we're, we're simply calling ourselves back to a reminder of this grand narrative in which we're participating and in which everything is being redefined by the reality of what God has made known in Jesus Christ. So I come into worship needing to reframe everything again and to be called back to remembrance of who is God, who is not God, who is my neighbor, who is, who is the person that I'm actually attending to, what are the priorities that, that I'm called to surrender, what are the places of my own neglect, my own sense of neediness, my own sense of, of fault, of sin that needs to be, uh, what are the forms of my own power that I need to once again repent of and or lay down or surrender or redefine? Uh, who are the people that I'm with in that process? To what end are we seeking to live our lives? What will this coming week be about? All of that is part of the what's at, at play, I think, in the context of worship. And when I sit under the authority of God as Lord, renaming in community all of those realities, then it's like a, a you know a major chiropractic readjustment that uh, that realigns the spine of my life for the sake of the vitality of what I'm going to then uh, hopefully begin to affirm and live in the course of that week. And, and that process and the rhythm of that um, is what helps call me back again and again to that sense of reordering. That's how I would understand yeah, it. Yeah, I really like that. But in addition, that, that as we do that in community, we do respond to God, this God who reorders, reframes, reprioritizes all that. We do respond to him. We respond to him. Um, I mean, theoretically, at some level, I could get some reorientation of the grand narrative just myself sure. in isolation. But we, we do it together so that our response is together. Uh, worship, corporate worship, is God-centered, and it's a community exercise. So there is love of God and love of neighbor going on also on Sunday morning as well. So we respond to God with praise, with uh, prayer, with intercession, with gratitude, we, in silence, in lament, in hope, in uh, contentment, in holy discontentment. All those kinds of things are part of that response. So there is this reordering, there is this response to God, but all of it then uh, equips us and prepares us for the variety of vocations, the variety of callings that this particular community has in the world uh, throughout the rest of their lives so that all of those reflect the, the glory and the values and the character and the purposes of God. So there's almost a, we could talk about a narrow and a broad sense of worship, where the broad sense is... That's, that's what, I, yeah, that's, that's what I think. You know, there is, there is the breadth of worship in all of life, and there is a, a narrow focus of this corporate gathering. And the, is worthy of the and the call is for congruence mm -hmm. between the narrow and the broad. Mm -hmm. Calvin saw the church as a schoolhouse and a place of, of constant learning and reform. So I think, you know, another image to use that we could... Uh, used to refer to worship in the small and broad sense is that, that the schoolhouse of, of Sunday worship is a place where we learn certain lessons which then we take out and continue seeking to learn and grow in as we live in the world and we come back in the context of, of a, the gathered church in order to continue and refine and, and test the, the learning. But we do some of that initially in the context of the Christian community, and then we get beyond that as we seek to uh, enact it courageously in the world. That's where we often also get stopped. So we think about all of these things in relationship to the church, but it gets contained within the precincts of the church's walls and disconnected from the larger life in, in general, and certainly disconnected, especially from the most marginal parts of society. And that's where I think, especially as, as a broadly middle, upper middle class church in America, there's a, a tendency to particularly make this disconnection. The disconnection between worship and justice that we've been talking about exists, I think, especially among privileged churches. It doesn't exist in places where the church does not live in contexts of privilege. And this is one of the reasons why the intrinsic connection between worship and justice is obvious, for example, to many American or Hispanic uh, and some Asian congregations, and is completely lost on, um, on many white uh, privileged churches. So I think that's another context in which then this schoolhouse is enriched as much as possible when the congregation 
is a reflection of that diversity of the people that God is actually seeking so that we are as a community practicing learning these lessons of remembrance and attentiveness that we are then meant to live in the context of our life. And presumably we you would both agree, though it's never been explicitly stated, that it's the work of Christ and the power of gospel that is the supreme reordering force Absolutely. that we're talking about. Absolutely, it is about. the supreme reordering yeah, yeah. force, yeah. yeah. You know, another image that sometimes you use that we've got the, the church as the schoolhouse and all that, the church is also a hospital. Mm -hmm. And and there is there is healing because we all, whether in privileged context or not, we, we live in a fallen world, we sin and we are sinned against, and, and all of us have hurts. Um, but the unique thing about the, the, the church as a hospital is that as the, the power of the gospel and the Holy Spirit brings healing, it's healing to ourselves for the purpose of the world. Where so often we get the disconnect as we, we, we think about healing. I mean, the average church is all about healing, inner healing, personal healing, but it's kind of, that's the goal. I, I want to get well, end of story. Um, and, and the church rightly, I think, reordered can say, we want you to get well for the sake of the call that God has in your life. So that once there is this sort of healing, I mean, there are, there are plenty of people who are so broken that it, it's not realistic at this moment in their life to say, you need to go out and serve in this kind of context. No, they, they need to be ministered to, they need to receive, but always with the view of, so once you're, once you're making progress, once you're healing, what is it that God is calling you to do? How, who is it that God is calling you to serve? So, so the, the hospital metaphor, I think, is also very rich, but it has this uniquely Christian focus as opposed to other sources of healing that are somewhat ends in themselves. Yeah, I, 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 think, I agree with that. I think that's a, that is a very important image. And certainly it's the case that many pastors' lives are preoccupied by the, being attentive to the healing needs of the congregation that you're serving, and therefore the energies that you might have to do something beyond that are, are difficult. Uh, it's partly what's been striking to me is the number of mental health programs that I think exist now where in the process of, of secular mental health situations, people are realizing that therapy needs to be combined with opportunities for social engagement and for even form, various forms of service. So they're experimenting with people that are inpatients in certain kinds of mental health clinics actually while they're seeking uh, the mental health help that they need professionally, are also being asked to actually serve someone else in the context of their own brokenness. That's not always a place that the church is very ready or willing to, to go. And I think that instinct of feeling like our mental health, as well as our spiritual health, really in part depends on our capacity to be able to become larger than simply self-interested people. I don't know that the church has that as clearly in mind sometimes as we really need to uh, and that sometimes we're reminded of in these other programs.